Well, good morning. Um, greetings to all of you. It's uh, good to be with you and see you, although through a glass, dark, a glass darkly, but uh, at least we do have some way of connecting. And uh, it's good to be able to share something with you today from the Word. And uh, I'd like to invite you to First Peter, the ch uh, first chapter of uh, Peter's epistle. Um, Vedran Shmolik, the lead cellist of the Sarajevo Opera, uh, took his place and in form, full formal attire, he grasped his bow and began to play uh, a classical piece. Uh, he was not in a concert hall and he was sitting amidst the rubble and ruin of his city, Sarajevo. The famous musician was playing his cello in the very place where a bomb had fallen, killing 22 people who had lined up to buy bread at a bakery. This was 1992, and the Bosnian War was bringing death and destruction to his city. But now, in the midst of the rubble in the ruin, Vedran played his cello, and many people expressed their appreciation for the unexpected concert. And the cellist went on to play the next day and continued to play his instrument. He did so for 22 days, one for each of the people killed on that location. And he went to play in other sites where mortar shells had claimed the lives of Sarajevo's citizens. And in the middle of the wreckage and ugliness Beautiful music was heard. No one knew where the where he would play next, but wherever Vedran went, crowds would gather to listen. And his music was a gift to all the grieving and suffering people of his city. It sent a message of hope and healing to hurting hearts. And it inspired people all over the world the cellist of Sarajevo became a symbol of how beauty stands in resistance to the horrors of war. It's been said that man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. People can't live without hope. And hope seems to be in short supply in the upside down world that we're living in. And the only people that have a real solid hope to hang on to are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first letter of Peter has much to say about the subject of hope. And he was writing to fellow believers scattered through Asia Minor. And they knew what suffering was all about. Rome had leashed had unleashed its fury upon Christian communities throughout the empire. And they were going through a fiery trial, as Peter puts it. It was a, a very hard moment. And Peter picks up his pen to strengthen the faith of suffering saints. And he reminds us of our glorious hope. So let's just read a portion of the first chapter here. 1 Peter 1, verse, not verse 1. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God 
through faith for salvation, ready to be re revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The tide had turned against the Christian community, but Peter writes them and he reminds them that although the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians, the triune God of heaven had chosen them, sanctified them, and cleansed them with the blood of Christ. And Paul, in his letters regularly, says, grace and peace be to you. But Peter, in typical fashion, injects a little more energy into the phrase and says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. And I love the multiplication that Peter talks about. And uh, the readers of his letter were going to need it. Since Nero had blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome, harassing believers had become a very popular sport. And Peter mentioned suffering 15 times in his letter. He uses eight different Greek words to do so. And he wants to encourage and give hope to his fellow believers in pain. And though we are not persecuted like the Christians in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, we're not strangers to trials. And Peter's letter has a message for all of us. Peter reminds his readers of what they have to cling to in hard times. And he mentions six reasons why we can face suffering with confidence. Let's briefly look at them together. Here's the first one. We have a living hope. That's verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, who has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, biblical hope is not wishful thinking or yearning for what might possibly be true. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I hope my cholesterol is not on the rise. I hope everything turns out okay. Well, P P Peter's not talking about that kind of hope. That may turn to be out to be wishful thinking, vain hopes. Peter is talking about a living hope. It's not going to die. It's not going to get derailed. It's not going to fizzle. It's not going to go up in smoke. This is hope with a built-in guarantee. This is a hope you can be sure about. And in a world of fake news and unrelenting disinformation, we do well to be skeptical about many things, but this is one thing we can be absolutely sure of. We have a living hope. In the days of the Roman persecution, they brought a Christian of lowly status before the judges. Do you think it possible, ask the judge, that someone like you will be a partaker of the glory of God? And the Christian responded, not only do I think it possible, I am certain of it. Well, you know, the Christian hope is not mere optimism. It's more than, an, than a positive outlook. It's a confident expectation that God is going to come through on everything he promised. And how do we know that? Well, our hope has a solid foundation. Look what Peter says. Look what gives credibility to our hope. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There had been a moment on a certain Friday that seemed anything but good when they killed Jesus of Nazareth. 
by nailing him to a tree. That was also a moment of death for all the hopes that had filled the disciples' hearts and despair came in with devastating force. Messiah was dead. And just when all seemed lost, something unexpected happened. On the third day, Hope stepped out of the tomb. He was alive and uh, dead. This is the solid foundation of our hope. And we can look at a world filled with violence and evil and corruption and deception. And we need not be filled with despair. We can even look death in the face and do so with hope because we believe in a Christ who conquered death. And um, we believe in a Christ who had the victory over that great enemy. And uh, his presence gives us hope even in the worst of circumstances. There's a great quote from James Stewart, famous old, well, not that old, uh, Jewish or sorry, Scottish preacher. And he says this, he compelled their dark achievements to serve his ends, not theirs. They nailed him to a tree, not knowing that by that very act, they were bringing the world to his feet. They gave him a cross, not guessing that he would make it a throne. They flung him outside the gates to die, not knowing that in that very moment, they were lifting up all the gates of the universe to let the king in. They thought to root out his doctrines, not understanding that they were implanting imperishably in the hearts of men the very name they intended to destroy. You know, it seemed like the Lord is always 10 steps ahead of the enemy and his best strategies, he turns them around and turns them on his head. Um, the resurrection of Christ certainly did that. And here's something else. Christ did not resurrect and go back to heaven in some spiritual fashion. No, he resurrected from the grave in bodily form. He ascended to heaven in a human, physical, material body. If the resurrection of Christ was a real physical resurrection, that means there is hope for the material physical creation in which we live and of which he became a part in the incarnation. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to the resurrection of Christ as the first fruits. That's an interesting choice of words, first fruits. What happened when Jesus walked out of the tomb is only the beginning. <laughs> it's the first stage. There's a massive harvest. There's a massive resurrection to follow. This was the beginning of a new creation. The resurrection is the good news. That this story is not just about leaving this planet one day and going off to heaven. It's the good news that God in Christ is committed to the renewal the reconciliation, the resurrection of all things. And it's not death nor darkness that wins in this story. The empty tomb tells us that in the end, God wins. And when our Lord finishes doing what he's going to do, the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There's an interesting Greek word that shows up twice in the New Testament. And it, it, ha it has in its root the word Genesis. It means a, a new Genesis, um, a complete renewal of the physical creation. Christ used it in Matthew 19, 28, when he talked about the fact that in the re regeneration, 
when the Son of Man sits on his throne of glory, regeneration, a regenesis. And uh, Paul refers, sorry, Peter refers to this when he, in Acts 3, speaks about the fact whom heaven must receive until the restoration of all things. And it's what Paul talked about in Colossians 1 when he said that it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Everything gets reconciled. The twisted, the broken, um, the damaged, <laughs> it all comes back to where it's supposed to be. So we know where this story will end. And the last chapter will be the most amazing one of all. The well-known British author Tolkien envisions a time when everything sad, in his words, everything sad is going to come untrue. I love that phrase. Everything sad is going to come untrue. Crookedness will be undone. Once attained, will work backwards and turn even agony into a glory. Hmm. That is the astounding hope that Christ gives to us. Global warming will not have the last word. Death will not have the last word. Evil will not have the final say. Neither will overpopulation or global governance. In the midst of a world where bad things happen, there's an irrefutable reason for hope. Christ has risen from the dead. And because of him and because of that, we have a glorious hope. And here's the second thing. Not only do we have a living hope, but we have an indestructible inheritance. That's verse four. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. An inheritance is something that we will possess in the future. And you know, in this life where there's an inheritance, there's a fight. And people come out of the woodwork to lay claim to the inheritance. And when those people pass on, there's another fight as others step forward to lay claim on the money. Well, nothing like that goes on here. Now, Peter does not tell us what the inheritance is. What Peter does tell us is what it is not. And he mentions four things. This inheritance is not corruptible. It is not, does not get defiled it does not fade away, and it's in safe storage in heaven. The things that we acquire in this world can be the latest, the best, the newest, the top of the line, the state of the art, but give it a little time, and it starts to wear out, rust out, and soon becomes old, outdated, and obsolete. Everything goes downhill. Well, nothing of this kind can affect our inheritance. Nothing can diminish its value. The passing of time will not affect it in any way because our inheritance lies in a kingdom where neither moth nor rust, rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. Hmm. That's good to know. And when Peter says it's reserved in heaven, what he means is it's out of this world. We might use the phrase. Um, Romans 8, Paul talks about this, and look what he says, uh, Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be.
but that, in, in, that involves the, the most amazing destiny that we could possibly imagine. And uh, in Paul, Paul here in Romans 8 states that one day the entire creation will be on tiptoe with bated breath to see the manifestation of the sons of God in glory. The day when God says, these are my sons and daughters. Here they are. And it will be amazing what God has produced, uh, considering the raw material that he started with. Uh, something people very glorious. Uh, Romans 3.23 says we fall short of the glory of God. Well, that's where we came from. That was our original condition. But in the final chapter of our story, we will not come short of the glory of God. We will be robed with the glory of God. There's a very amazing inheritance that lies ahead. But not only do we have a living hope and an indestructible inheritance, here's something else. We have divine protection. That's verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation to be revealed in the last time. We should not think that being kept by the power of God means kept from trouble or kept from hardship. Peter is not thinking of that kind of kept. Rather, he's thinking about the fact that no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what comes our way, nothing can touch our salvation. Nothing can take away the blessings we have in Christ. In him we have eternal life and all the power of hell can do nothing to take that away. We are protected by the most efficient security system available, the power of God. And there's no calamity, there's no tragedy, there's no virus that can derail God's purpose for us. And no matter what comes our way, our souls are divinely protected. History tells us of a courageous Christian who stood trial before one of the Roman emperors. And the emperor was demanding that Christians abandon their faith, deny the Lord, and declare Caesar as Lord. But this Christian refused. So the emperor threatened, give up Christ or I will banish you. The Christian said, you can't banish me from Christ, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The emperor said, I will confiscate all your property. The believer said, my treasures are laid up in heaven. You can't touch them. The emperor said, then I will put you to death. The Christian responded, I have been dead to the world in Christ for 40 years. My life is hid with Christ in God. You can't touch it. The emperor turned to those around him and said, what can you do with such a fanatic? We may be weak, but he is strong <laughs> and faithful. Our faith may falter, but he is faithful. And we're not trusting in our ability to hold on to him. We are confident that he will hold on to us. And we continue to walk by faith, not because of our stamina, but because God is faithful. He sustains us, and he's committed to seeing us through to the end. So according to this passage, the believer has a living hope, an indestructible inheritance, divine protection. And fourthly, we have a God who uses trials to burn off the dross. Notice verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice a few things about trials from these verses. Um, they are short-lived. Peter says, for a little while. Also, he says that they are necessary, if need be. And he says they're painful. If you have been grieved, he says. And uh, they also come in a variety of ways. He talks about various 
trials, they are diverse and uh, they cause our faith to be tested by fire. So they are also purposeful. Now, precious metals are freed from impurities by putting them through fire. Precious faith gets purified in similar manner. I can remember the first years that uh, I was in Bolivia and there was a time when I found myself in a very difficult, difficult situation. Some very uncomfortable pressures that made life unbearable and things were really tough. And I was sorely tempted to buy a ticket and to catch a flight back to Canada. And as I wrestled with that situation, I, I began to think about it. And I thought, okay, um, did God bring me here? Yes, he did. He clearly did. Did God know that stuff like this was going to happen? Yes. Did God uh, purpose to use these kinds of situations to, to uh, work in my life and to deal with my character? Yeah. Can he give me the grace to grow and to overcome in this situation, yes. Okay, then I'm gonna stay. <laughs> and uh, I can now look back and I now saw how God used some of those pressures to teach me some lessons that I really needed to learn, particularly about having a, a servant's heart. Folks, could you imagine what we would be like if we all just cruised through life and never ran into any hardships or difficulties? If everything always came out just the way we wanted, we would be the most prideful, arrogant, smug, self-sufficient, self-centered people if trials and tribulations didn't come along to knock some of that stuff out of us. Nobody would be able to put up with us. We would be absolutely unbearable if God didn't put us through fire to get rid of some of the dross. Trials not only help deal with our pride, they also test the genuineness of our faith. And when suffering barges into our lives, one of the questions God is asking is, will you continue to trust me? You trusted me when things were going well, Will you trust me when everything is going wrong? Well, trials have a way of showing what our faith is made of. And when faith stands up to fire, the end result, as it says here, is praise, honor, and glory. And who gets the praise, honor, and glory? Look carefully at verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, usually it's the Lord who deserves the praise, the honor, and the glory, but that's not what Peter is talking about here. Here it is praise, honor, and glory for the believer who has gone through the fire and come out with his faith intact, God will honor that person in a special way. That's what this verse is talking about. And I don't know about you, but when we get to the other side, to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant, folks, that's worth more than streets of gold and mansions in glory. Could anything possibly Compare with that. I don't think so. I don't think so. So we have a God who's going to use trials for our good. And uh, he's going to use them to burn off some of the dross. And uh, here's another thing. We have an unseen Savior. An unseen Savior. Notice verse 8. Whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And I think Peter is drawing a contrast between himself and his readers. It was his great privilege to have known Jesus of Nazareth and to walk with him for 
three years, they had heard the gospel. They had come to believe in Christ. They had come to love Christ, although they had never seen him. And now that the fire of adversity has come upon them, the question was, will you continue to love him? Will you continue to follow and love this Lord who gave himself for you? Will you continue to love this Lord whom you have never seen? We did not have the privilege of seeing him when he was here, but we have come to love him. And I love that story in Genesis 24 when Abraham sent his servant Eliezer to get and to find a bride for his son Isaac. And Eliezer makes that journey and he comes to the well where Rebecca shows up and uh, he identifies himself. And uh, well, he prayed and God gave him a sign and he invites her to come back and marry his master's son and she accepts and uh, the family gives their blessing and they set out on the journey and she's going to marry somebody she's never seen. And uh, I can imagine as they trekked across the desert with their camels every night around the campfire, Rebecca had a lot of questions. Tell me about him. What's Isaac like? What does he look like? What is his personality like? And she no doubt pumped Eliezer who had known him from birth and she wanted to know about the man that she was going to that uh, she had never seen but uh, probably she was going to love and she would one day be with him folks that's our situation isn't it we've never seen the lord we will see him one day although we have not seen him we do love him and as we read the scripture the holy spirit is our teacher to teach us more about the wonderfulness of the one to whom we belong. We have an invisible savior who one day will be visible to our eyes. And lastly, we have a guaranteed deliverance, a guaranteed deliverance. Verse nine, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, it's here that someone might say, I thought that salvation was something that we already had. Well, salvation comes in three phases. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. And we're waiting to be saved from the presence of sin. So when the Bible says, by grace, you have been faith saved through faith, that's God dealing with our past. When it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's God helping us to overcome in the present. But what we have here in verse 9 is not past or present. It's future salvation. It's God delivering us from the very presence and influence of everything that pulls us down and contradicts our new nature when all our brokenness is fully healed. The first phase is justification. The second phase is sanctification. And the final phase is glorification. We're waiting for the final installment. We're waiting for God to conclude the good work that he has begun in us. And we look forward to the moment when we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. As many of you know, for many years, my wife, Wendy, has visited prisons in Bolivia. And she goes into very dark places where violence and stealing and rape and killing take place regularly. Wendy and others go show God's love in every possible way, providing whatever is needed, friendship, a birthday cake, a blanket, a prayer, or anything else. And for many, Wendy has become the mother they never had, and numerous prisoners call her Mama Wendy. On one occasion, another volunteer in the prison suggested that Wendy visit a young man in isolation named Daniel, 
who had attempted to take his life. Wendy and Katie were given permission to visit him, and not many minutes had gone by before the young man was in her arms weeping and telling his story. As a child, he had been abandoned to live on the streets. At an early age, he was trained to use arms and to be a sicario, a hitman. He, he killed someone for the first time at age 12. And when he was 15, he was sent to prison with a sentence of 30 years and another of 15. And Wendy listened as Daniel sobbed and told his story. At that moment, God placed in her heart a special love for this young man who lived in such a loveless world. And she began to visit him, to pray for him, and to call him regularly. At times he did better. At other times he relapsed into a dark place. Wendy continued to reach out to him. She saw him enslaved to drugs and under the, the control of dark powers and she continued to love him and to cry out to God for him. One day, Wendy felt the urge to phone him and share a portion from Proverbs. She read verses that speak of violent men and the need to avoid them. And afterwards, there was silence at the end of the line. And I was about to kill someone. Now I know there's a God. Well, Daniel was sent from one penitentiary to another. Everyone was afraid of this man. Wendy continued to keep in touch with him, to pray for him, often with tears. She persisted in loving him, and little by little, she saw God work in his life. Quite a few years have gone by now, and Daniel is now out of prison. He's walking with God and growing in his faith. His life has changed dramatically. He's always talking about the Lord and has a passion to help others come to freedom in Christ. Many of his friends cannot believe. family members who would come to visit them. Daniel never had that. And it angered him that others did. And he would sometimes turn on these inmates and give them a nasty thrashing. His unmet hunger for love would turn into violence. But when he came to experience the love of God, that changed completely. And Daniel has become one of the most tender hearted people we know. He phones us often, sometimes more than once a week. One day he said to Wendy, Mama Wendy, years ago, if someone said to me, God loves you, that made no sense to me. There was so much pain and, and suffering in my life that I couldn't believe that God loved me. But you showed me the love of God. You have been with me through good and bad times and you continue to love me. I have come to believe in God and in his love because I have seen that love in you. Praise God that in a dark world, there's a bright hope. <laughs> and it's the wonderful gospel of the love of God. It's the hope of the gospel. Two closing thoughts. One. If Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then there is no circumstance that he cannot turn around. If he rose from the dead on the third day, then there is no circumstance that he cannot turn around. There is no situation where he cannot work for good. There is no circumstance so chaotic that God cannot work in the midst of it to create something wonderfully good. He did that at the cross, and he continues to do it today in the lives of those who turn to Christ. So no matter where you are at, no matter how bad the mess, he continues to be a God of hope. And uh, we sure need to shut off the alarmism and the fear-mongering and the 
the falsehood that comes to us from CBC and CNN and live in the light of our hope, we need to play our cello in the midst of the ruins. As a matter of fact, Peter calls us to live in such a way that those around us are forced to ask why we live with such hope. He says that in chapter three, verse 15. So if Christ rose from the dead, there's no circumstance he can't turn around. And if our God is a God of hope, then we have every reason to live life with joy. So keep playing your cello. Keep living with joy. Keep spreading joy. If God is a God of hope, then there's light in the dark world where we live. There is one grand and glorious hope in this sad world. The resurrection of Christ is the great game changer. Because of Christ, we have a living hope, an unshakable hope. And I'm struck by the words that Peter uses at the end of verse 8, where he talks about rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Well, he was writing to people that were really going through the mill. <laughs> and he talks about this kind of joy. Well, you know, in a world where things are looking really dark, here we have people who are not who not only have hope, but they have joy. And to have joy inexpressible and full of glory in the midst of persecution and hatred, well, that requires a hope of huge proportions. And that is exactly what we have. The greatness of our hope leads to greatness of joy. May God help us to glimpse more clearly the reality, the wonder, the greatness of our hope and live in the light of it, knowing that it is a living hope. It's alive. In a world where dark clouds are gathering and uh, things look rather difficult, we need to be givers of hope, don't we? People's hearts are failing them for fear and well, they might, well, they might, but we have no cause to. Let's keep playing our cello. <laughs> let's be hope bringers. Uh, let's live out our hope in a world that desperately needs it. And let me leave you with this beautiful verse, these words of Paul from Romans 15, 13, where he says this, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. It's no matter how things turn out, we have come to take refuge in a God of hope. May the reality of our living hope get a grip on our hearts. May it permeate our thoughts. May we live lives dominated by hope and may we be bringers of hope. We ask this in the name of the one who is the reason of our hope, whom having not seen, we love. Amen.